um, personal property. Uh, again, they deal with returns as well. So if you have business personal property, now there's a distinction between real and personal. Real property, you have the option of making a return. And like I say, I highly suggest you do. Personal property, you are still required by law to make a return on that personal property. Now, how many people in here have made a return on real property within the past two years? Because two years ago, you were still required by law to do it, but most people did not know that you were required by law to make that return. Um, they're accepting on personal side, we're accepting free port exemptions right now, and also appeals will be coming up shortly. Um, on a daily basis, personal property, whenever we get outside of these uh, date-specific areas, uh, they're working on audits and motor vehicle appeals, which we can get throughout the year as well, based on when you get your tax bill on your motor vehicle. Uh, mobile homes, again, they're going through returns, they're going through appeals. Uh, the pre-bill digest is the one difference with mobile homes. They actually have to have, the, or we actually have to have the pre-bill digest over to the tax commissioner before January the 1st so that she can send out those bills on those mobile homes the first part of January. So the people who are on, in a pre-bill mobile home are actually getting tax bills right now, and that's also their notice of value for them to appeal on. Uh, that date runs through 45 dates, days after the mail date or May the 1st, whichever one comes the latest. So basically May the 1st is when you got is your deadline to make an appeal on a pre-bill mobile home. Um, throughout the year, you know, mobile homes is actually, like I said before, going through and looking for those, making sure those tags are displayed on all of those mobile homes. That's, we're actually supposed to touch every single mobile home once every year, we're actually supposed to be out there and viewing it at least, making sure they got that tag displayed. Uh, mapping, they're always going to be working on splits, combinations, new sales, new parcels, um, you know, doing deed research. Uh, they also do the backup work on covenants and timber sales. They track the timber sales. If any of you have ever harvested timber, you've probably met Cheryl Mims, or if you've worked on Akuva, you've met Cheryl Mims as well. Uh, she's been there, I believe, about 30 years. And irreplaceable with her, in, her institutional knowledge. Um, two, th uh, two things I was going to mention real quick, too. On the Valor website, uh, if anybody has any interest in going there, the address to that is www.valorgis.com. Uh, yeah, it's free to use, I believe, for the most part, so I would go check that out, as well as our uh, website, which is www.qpublic.net forward slash GA forward slash lands. Or you can go to the county website and just go to the assessor's tab and follow the links to get there as well. Uh, but we've got a lot of tools where you can look at mapping, you can look at records and so forth online. Uh, the mapping actually will also color code your uh, sales for you in an area. So if you want to look at what, how properties are selling in an area, you can get an idea by going there and looking uh, on those maps. Um, the data entry, um, it's pretty hard to put into words what exactly those folks handle. Um, uh, you know, you have your data entry who handle just the day-to-day -day data entry stuff, but um, we also have folks who they, they build specialized reports in that area. Uh, either the reports come from requests from appraisers in-house in or from myself or uh, sometimes the public. Uh, some of those reports are canned reports where it's just press of a button, change a few parameters and hit go. Sometimes it's just a built from the ground up to suit a certain purpose. Um, all of these departments, they actually work, you know, when a piece of, when, when some work comes in, every single department touches that. I mean, it, it goes all the way through. I don't want y'all to think that all we do is just appraise property. Um, like I stated before, almost all these properties do require appraiser designations though from the Department of Revenue. Um, we, are we are mandated to uh, receive 40 hours of training every two years to keep our uh, certifications current. And uh, once all this work is done, the assessors each month, whenever they meet, whenever the, the staff comes up with proposed changes, whatever they may be, uh, to make a certain property exempt, uh, to 
you know, to grant conservation use or to not grant, grant conservation use or to deny, deny homestead or approve it. The proposals done by the staff, you know, valuation proposals are done by the staff, and the assessors wind up looking over all this work once a month, and then they, they put their nod of approval or deny on that. Because in the end, it, it is the assessors who are responsible, and we try to uh, do the best job we can for them to make sure that they've got the best information at hand. Um, that is my very stripped-down version of it. So if anybody has any questions, please fire away. Yes, sir. Okay. Pardon? Absolutely. <laughs> Um, well, I don't, it's hard to say, uh, uh, area mass, I, it, it's really hard to say, I'd have to run a report. Um, I can tell you we have, I want to think we have near to over, I mean, well over a thousand, if I'm not mistaken, a thousand churches or proper, properties belonging to churches that we've looked at. Um, you know, then you, there's so many people that are exempt, uh, you know, Naturally, all government is exempt uh, as long as they're not operating uh, in contest with uh, the fair market. So, you know, uh, if uh, you know, we don't have any examples of that, actually, so I don't want to get into that. I mean, the, the exempt property laws get really ticky, and uh, that's why we have an extremely lengthy write up process for making a property exempt or not exempt because you can really shoot yourself in the foot uh, when, you're, when you're working on those. Um, but to answer your question, I can't give you an accurate answer on that. But there, there are a lot. There are a lot. Do these in Pinellas County in the IRS uh, exemption numbers I believe we looked into this not too long ago. And if I remember correctly, the answer wound up being no. Um, you have to, sorry. Yes, yes, you do. You have to be 501c3 approved. However, if the church is the owner, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact start circumstance. But yes, you do need 501c3 approval to be listed exempt on, a, on religious worship. Yes, ma'am. Personal property is basically uh, it's movable in nature. You have two types. You have two types of property. You have tangible and intangible. Tangible property is going to be anything that you can touch. Intangible is going to be things like franchise rights. Um, so in the state of Georgia, you cannot tax intangibles. On the tangible property, you have two types of tangible property. You've got personal property, and you have real property. So personal property is going to be your machines, your equipment. Um, Great example is going to be pretty much the paper mill, uh, wild adventures, those massive roller coasters. That's personal property. Uh, all the chairs you're sitting in, personal property. Uh, we do not tax, we do not go after the personal property in your home, but in a business, the furnishing is is a, a considered personal property and is valued. Now, personal property, it has. It, it, its depreciation rate is just, yeah, I mean, it's very fast. Uh, it gets down to residual quickly within, you know, like chairs and stuff, it's going to be, I believe, in like five years, it's a residual uh, value. But, uh, you know, the longer lasting machineries are on different life schedules. So it can be anything from that ride you're on out there at uh, Wild Adventures to the chair you're sitting in here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, 20. 20 employees, 21 counting myself. Okay, uh, how does it break down along rates and interest? Uh, let's see. Uh, I have to think about it. We've got, it's basically half and half, uh, male and female. Um, race, uh, I believe we have, uh, let's see, three African American and the rest are going to be Caucasian. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
part I didn't hear the last bit. Well, it, it's depending. It, it, whatever the property is, it's got to be used for the purposes of religious worship or intricately tied to that. So, um, you know, the pastor's office or, you know, uh, any kind of, um, uh, at a loss for the word, but uh, basically uh, parsonages. Uh, things like that would be, or, yes, ma'am. If they're charging rent, if they're charging rent, receiving rent for that property, yes. If they're housing people for free, no. Yes, yes, if basically in a nutshell, if if they're charging rent, yes. then no, it is it is taxable. Okay. Yes. Yes, sir. Oh, Lord, I knew somebody was going to ask that question. Uh, yes, the, the automobile tax is going to change. Um, I would defer to Mary Neal Robertson let y'all explain that to you, but I can tell you a little bit about it. Uh, it's my basic understanding that what's going to happen with those car tags is that uh, when you buy it, it's going to be a flat fee, and I can't remember that fee off the top of my head, but I think it's going to be somewhere around 7%. 9% or something like that, um, you're going to pay a set, you're going to pay a tax right then. It's going to be, uh, you know, I don't believe it's going to change much for if you're buying from a dealer. What's really going to change is casual sales. Casual, casual sales are going to change a lot because it doesn't matter if I give you my car. Um, when you go down to get your tag, they're going to charge you that percentage of the book value and it's due then. So that's what's really going to change. Through a dealer, it's not really going to change much. In fact, you might get away paying less tax. But if you, on your car that you have now, this is only for something that's bought in, I believe, March 1st of this year. Anything before that, you have the option to opt in and pay that one-time fee, or you can continue paying like you are now. So it's only for purchases after March the 1st. Like I said, I, I, you know, if I led you astray on any facts on that, I, I apologize. But that's not really in our wheelhouse too much, other than we expect for our mobile home or sorry, motor vehicle appeals to go through the roof because we, you know, every year we have about four or five to the point where every time we have one, we got to figure out how to do them again because you don't see it that much. Well, we expect we're going to our mo our motor vehicle appeals are going to go uh, up drastically. So. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, I just recently heard about this whole thing about returns. Can you tell us more about returns? Like, have we always been happy to do those or nobody knew? And what percentage of people actually do that? Uh, well, yes. Uh, formerly, before this year, you were required on real property to make returns. It was That was the law. However, they had it wrote into the law where you had uh, automatic returns that were done. Um, so if you did not come and physically make a return, the the value that you paid taxes on the prior year is what you accepted as is or as the value, and that's what you're returning it at. Um, now it's you have the option to make that return. Um, basically, all that is is coming into our office, filling out a piece of paper, and telling us what you think the value of the property is. Also, telling us what's on the property, or if you've made any changes and taken anything off the property. Um, it's you know it, it really helps us get things going ahead of time before the appeal stage because the appeal stage comes right up against submission of the digest. So the more this stuff we can have worked out ahead of time, then the more accurate digest we can turn over without changes because, you know, the digest has already been turned over to the Board of Commissioners, to the Board of Education long ago, back in the summer. We're still working on appeals for 2012 that are adjusting that digest. So the return phase, when we can get the information ahead of time, does help us get a lot of that done. Uh, normally, we only see about, we're lucky if we see about 1,500, 2,000 returns, we, we would be lucky. That's out of 47,000 or almost 48,000 parcels of real property and 6,000 
almost uh, personal property tax. Yes, sir. Do you get returns on the industrial parcels or the industrial parts? We don't get it from the industrial authority. We get it because the industrial authority is an exempt entity. Uh, we get it from the actual companies. So the, the companies who are in an industrial authority agreement, the abatement agreements, we get a return from them. Now, their, their values are going to be, we argue fair market value. We don't argue with them their abatement schedule. So say if they're in the first year of it, at, say they're responsible for 10% of the value, it's going to be 10% of that fair market value. So that's what we argue over is the fair market value, not the abatement schedule. And, and also on returns, you can, I forgot to tell you, you can actually just write it on a piece of paper, sign it, and designate, you know, it's for my house at 123 North Ashley Street and go with it. Um, was there a second part of that? Yes, yes, they, the, to get the industries in, and I don't want to go into all their business because I only know the part of it that I mess with, which is going to be your, you know, we find out what property is underneath this industrial authority agreement, and we get an abatement schedule, and usually it's going to be through 12 years, so it's going to have some odd percentage breakdowns, uh, but basically about 10% a year is what it's going to uh, go up each year. And it usually doesn't start until the project is completely ready to go. And now another key date comes in there, January the 1st. Um, January 1st is our date of valuation for everything. So whatever the state of the property is as of January 1, that's also comes into play, whether or not it's complete or not. But um, yeah, we basically, yes. We'll give it to you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, yes, all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is very informative. Um, many of us don't know about how all the different parts of the government work and play together, and, and so thanks for coming in and helping us know about that. Yes. Yeah, I see that Mike, Mike Hill has also joined us here, Mike, and Demarcus Marshall, our new county commissioner, has also joined us during this talk. So, Mike, do you have any? Okay. Do you, you you didn't have any other gem of wisdom that you wanted to tell us? Okay. Um, at this time, we'll move briefly to our officers' reports. Um, Dr. Marks will give us an elections report. Uh, we had a, uh, a mixed election season. Uh, we did well at the, at the top, uh, re-electing President Obama. Uh, it's worthwhile noting that in Lowndes County, uh, Romney uh, received 54% uh, of the vote and the president received 45% of the vote. Out of every nine people in Lowndes County who voted, four of them voted Democratic, and five of them voted Republican. The county is not as Republican, and the state of Georgia is not as Republican as most people think. I want to congratulate the Democrats uh, who were elected uh, at the, at the uh, local, local level. Uh, Dexter Sharper uh, to uh, the um, uh, state house. Uh, out of uh, District 177. Uh, Sheriff Chris Pine was reelected. Uh, as Mary Nell Robertson was reelected tax commissioner. All three tax assessors, uh, Doyle Kelly, W.G. Walker, and Mike Hill, were elected as Democrats. Bill Watson was elected as coroner. Gretchen Quarterman ran a terrific race and uh, got 40. Uh, got 
uh, 46 percent of, of the vote. Uh, she actually, percentage-wise, outpolled the president. Uh, also re-elected to the county commission, uh, Joyce Evans. <laughs> uh, newly elected, Demarcus Marshall. Uh, so uh, we've, we've got some, some good results to show for, for 2012. But now it's 2013, and there are going to be more elections coming up in 2013. Uh, since it's an odd year, uh, the elections are municipal elections. Uh, the municipal elections are uh, nominally nonpartisan, uh, but uh, we know who the good Democrats are, and so uh, we know folks that uh, we want to we want to support. Uh, let me simply tell you which offices are going to be up for election uh, this year. Uh, half of the city council of Valdosta is up for election, uh, post two, four, and six. Uh, that's Deidre White, Alvin Payton Jr., and Robert Yost. Uh, the Valdosta school board, uh, districts one, two, and three. That's Annie Fisher. Uh, Vanessa Flukas and uh, Warren Lee, and also in the other municipalities, uh, the uh, mayor of uh, Hayhira, uh, Wayne Bullard, and uh, districts one and four, uh, Terry Benjamin and Rose Adams. In Lake Park, uh, the mayor and all four council members are up for election. Uh, maybe they can get uh, government, city government back on its feet in Lake Park one of these years. Uh, Dasher, the mayor in posts one and two, and in Remerton, uh, uh, half of the half of the city council. So there are serious elections uh, coming coming up this year. If you are interested in running for one of those offices, uh, please uh, talk to Dick Sager, who is the vice chair for.